technical things we can talk about here is what's coming out of a 3D printer. And some of the use cases where this really makes sense is for patient care, and that's what we're going to hear about in this next session. Medical 3D printing, inno uh, innovating patient care through customized implants. And the speaker is Samuel Albert Trusø, and you are from Aarhus University. Give him a hand. So, um, what's unique about medical 3D printing is, of course, that you can do devices customized to the uh, individual patient. This is something that's been known for uh, quite a long time in uh, the standard industry. We don't all have the same shoe size, so we can get whatever shoe we like, but only in predefined categories. So, we have a size 10 or size 9, that's okay, but let's say you have a size 9.5, you're out of luck. The same goes for, of course, uh, brass. Always a point of contention during Christmas time where poor guys have to buy something for their wives and get this right. But again, you have predefined sizes. T-shirts, large, medium, small, and all that. But of course, in the clothing industry, we do have customized clothing. We have tailors. We have some guys who can do a suit for a given person and only that person. The same is actually, uh, well, individualization is also occurring in this sector. So we have these uh, booths where you can actually get a 3D body scan and get a customized suit made. So that's coming in the, uh, in the clothing area. If we uh, switch to the medical industry, we have sort of the same problem. So in this case, we've got catheters going into the uh, bladder to empty it. These are measured on a uh, French scale historically. So it's just different diameters. But again, we have these preset diameters for any given patient. Same holds for um, customized, well, not customized, sorry, for, uh, for hip implants. We've got a range of ball sizes. We've got a range of stem lengths. We've got a range of angles and all that. But we choose from pre-existing uh, models, which works beautifully if you have a sort of standard body. But sometimes you do have patients like this where we actually have a whole section of bone missing. So no standard solution would fit this patient. So in this case, we'd like to be able to just print a device for this given patient and nobody else in the whole world. That's where 3D printing comes in. So um, what does it take? Well, you need some sort of scan of the patient. You need to segment it to get a virtual model. And then you need to create the physical model using 3D printing. I'll go through that rapidly, and then I'll cover as many clinical cases as I actually can. <laughs> but the time I allocate it, uh, we'll see how many we go through. So basically, first of all, you get the patient into a scanner. We get some sort of data. In this case, it's a computer tomography or CT scanner. So these. Uh, Slices of patient information are loaded into a computer program, in this case, a software called Mimics, where an operator chooses a given grayscale value and extracts a given organ, in this case, the heart. This data can be transmitted over to a 3D printer like this and printed, and then you get a physical model like this. I am not saying that you can 3D print a heart. That's not the basic output of this. Mm -hmm. But I do present a case in just a moment where we actually use 3D hard models for planning purposes. So just to go into the 3D printing process a little bit more deeply, this is a powder printer or SLS printer where we have plastic powder. We extract the small layer. We have a laser it's melting the very top layer. It's preheated to almost the smelting point of the <coughs> the uh, plastic, and then the laser inputs the rest. Then we do another powder layer, and we melt the next layer, and we melt the next layer, and so forth. So it builds and builds and builds until we get a final model. Then we remove it from the uh, powder stack and blow off any unburnt powder and get the final model uh, out. This is plastic, but we can also do it in metal like this. So again, we just heat until it's almost melting. And then do a laser and melt the final steps. 
Then we've done a layer. We let it cool down a little bit, get a new layer on top in just a second. And then the whole process repeats, layer by layer by layer throughout the model. So that's what it takes. But where can we use it? So I said before, we don't print hearts, but we do actually print heart models. Some would like to print hearts. That's quite far off. But just to build a 3D model of a heart can actually be of a great service in especially congenital heart defects. You guys up there probably have pretty standard hearts. I mean, heart surgery is not that complicated once you know what's inside. But there are a number of uh, small babies born who have severe malformations of the heart. For instance, this one, the tetralogy of Thalot, where all the standard vessels are basically not where they're supposed to be. There's <clears throat> all kinds of connections that shouldn't be there. They really don't know what they're going into. So standard model of doing this would be to create the CT scan and then just have a computer and try to look through it and say, well, guess what? How could I go in here? How could I do this? But it takes a special kind of brain to translate these 2D images into a 3D world. But if we create this 3D model of the heart, you can actually try and test it out and put it in the catheter and see whether or not we can ac access wherever the uh, geometry matches uh, whatever heart valve we're trying to insert and all that. So we're actually using that for um, surgical planning in hospitals around the world. So that's purely model-based, purely planning. What about these implants? Well, the best case is this uh, guy called Kaiba. He has a um, disease called tracheomalacia, which basically means that his airways are defective. His cartilage is not strong enough to keep it open. When you breathe, the lungs expand. We have negative pressure, so we draw in air into the lungs. That means that our trachea, and particularly male guys know this, you have the uh, Adam's apple. So we've got a cartilage skeleton holding open the airways in negative pressure. But this guy had some defects in that respect. So the normal bronchus feeding air into the lungs tended to collapse. And he was scheduled for a respirator. And basically, nobody expected him to survive. So they did some images of his airways. And you can easily visualize the, uh, the problem. His airways are completely blocked. So what to do? Well, an engineer came up with a um, solution in which we uh, scanned and extracted his airways and then created this little stent going in around his airways, holding it open. The um, operation was a complete success, and, and he was able to breathe normally just uh, a month later, and it's been replicated a number of times. The problem is that these airways are the standard airways, so we can't use the same model across every single patient. We have to scan each baby and say, well, what's the specific geometry of the individual baby? Uh, the smart thing about this one is this one is uh, printed in a material called polylacro, polycaprolactone, uh, which is biodegradable. In a year or two, his airways are actually strong enough to stay open, so it's only a time-sensitive issue. So in this case, this actually gets degraded inside the body and gets removed all by itself. He doesn't have to have surgery once his defect has been corrected. So again, individual treatment for this given patient. Another excellent case involving actually the cloud, so the cloud gets mentioned <laughs> again here, um, is this uh, titanium cartilage block. So if you've got a um, breakdown of your cartilage inside the knee or uh, hip, you have severe pains because the cartilage is actually supposed to create a frictionless movement so you can move around. But in some patients, this gets degraded and, and they're in severe pain. So a Swedish company has actually come up with a solution where you scan the uh, knee or hip or whatever remotely, ship them their MI data. They do the uh, down assessment of the uh, data. They print a given implant in titanium for this defect. They also, which is very nice, print a uh, surgical guide to allow the surgeon to just drill precisely where he has to drill in order to fit this, defect, this uh, titanium plug. And then they sterilize the kit, send it to the surgeon remotely, ready for surgery. 
why do we need customized titanium plugs? Why not just do a given standard one? Well, the geometry of the knee really, really changes from patient to patient. So you can't do a given standard plug because the surface is always changing and depending on where the damage is situated, you need different plugs. So we do need customized devices in this respect. As I said, the surgery itself gets much easier because we actually print this device which gets put over the uh, defect and lets the surgeon just drill with the standard two inside this uh, place and then you have a perfect match for the uh, plug. So it's very much simpler and faster to, uh, to operate using this procedure. So that was knees and that was uh, uh, Trachemalacia, the airways. If we go to these artificial hips I showed you earlier, then we have a device like this one um, used for patients with abnormal hips. So again, going back to my initial uh, slides, if you have a patient, a standard patient with a standard hip, um, you can use these uh, different standard methodologies where we've got these given ball type and given angles given stem lengths and all that, and it'll fit perfectly. But if you show up with a patient like this, nothing will fit because the geometry is so abnormal that we can't do anything about that in, in the normal manner. So in this case, it's a 16-year-old uh, Swedish girl who um, again was scanned and we created a 3D model of her bones. And you can see here that there's quite a lot missing. So first of all, reconstruct the bones and then find out, well, where do we want the, uh, the ball socket to be? Where do we want to put the screw holes? The screw holes can actually be put according to bone quality. We also know the bone quality from the scan. So we can situate each of these perfectly. And then we need to put in a number of screws in given lengths. They are not all the same length because the bone, of course, is varying in depth which also can be utilized later on. So we can also actually do, this is from a uh, company in uh, Aalborg who, do, who does uh, biomechanic simulations, sorry. So we can get a uh, sort of dynamic stress distribution of the uh, implant and try to reevaluate whether or not it should be constructed that way or not. So now I've got the geometry, send it to a printer, get it out, and of course sterilize and all that. And then we uh, put it in the uh, patient. Again, the procedure is vastly more simple than the uh, standard way of doing it because we can put this device in, it fits perfectly, but then we can also put in a, uh, a guide, a drilling guide. If you look closely, you can perhaps visualize that the um, sort of stops here are different lengths. So basically the surgeon all it has to do is to put it all the way through it gets to the correct depth. The screws were different depths before. So again, he doesn't have to think, he just has to drill right down, put in all the screws, and you know, the functioning hip for this given patient. Again, nobody else but her. Then we of course have to line it with um, some material and all that, but basically the basic contents are we can do a device for her and her only. Um, that's basically all I had time for uh, during a 15 minute presentation, but I could have talked about a lot of different other things. There's uh, bioprinting with different stem cells. There's a lot of other fancy uses where we do skull caps and all that in 3D prints. We can print bone materials which dissolve inside the body and, and allows us to print bones. This is a company from Uden, so actually. And there's Quite a lot of work going on doing printing of uh, cartilage, for instance, ears, which gets ripped off. Then we can construct an ear from the other ear and get cartilage to grow on these scaffolds and put them in. Um, but again, during a 15 minute time frame, that's out of scope. If you really want to know more about this, I can, yeah. Yeah, go to this uh, conference in Lübeck in, uh, in uh, September. There should be a lot more information during today's time frame. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.